Coming up on today's episode of Airborne, the European Space Agency confirms Feli has touched down on Comet 67P. NASA leases Moffett Airfield to Google. And FAA officials say a UAV rule is coming soon. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. ESA's Feli Lander has touched down on Comet 67P. The European Space Agency confirmed the touchdown by sending a message on Twitter announcing, quote, receipt of signal from surface, end quote. That was shortly after the landing on Wednesday morning. The landing, which was 300 million miles from Earth, culminates a 10-year journey for the Feli spacecraft. It's reported the message from the comet confirming the landing took 28 minutes to reach Earth. The Feli spacecraft was programmed to send out tweets automatically when it landed. A tweet went out in several languages that said, Touchdown, my new address, 67P. Video of the event was sent back to Earth from the Rosetta spacecraft that carried the Feli lander to the comet. It's interesting to note that Twitter had not even been invented and Windows XP was the common Microsoft operating system when the mission left Earth 10 years ago. So we're witnessing a spectacular scientific accomplishment. NASA has signed a lease with Planetary Ventures, LLC, to manage Moffett Federal Airfield, an agency facility located in Moffett Field, California, and rehabilitate its historic Hangar 1. NASA estimates the lease will save the agency approximately $6.3 million and provide $1.16 billion in rent over the initial 60-year lease term. The negotiated lease, which is neither a procurement action nor a government contract, will put Hangar 1 to new use and eliminate NASA's management cost of the airfield, with the federal government retaining title to the property. Planetary Ventures currently plans to invest more than $200 million in capital improvements to the property and commits in the lease to several undertakings that will benefit the public upon completion. They plan to refurbish and protect historic Hangar 1 and rehabilitate Hangars 2 and 3. Once renovations are complete, Hangar 1 will again be home to high-tech innovations as the historic facility is used for research development, assembly and testing in the areas of space exploration, aviation, rover robotics, and other emerging technologies. Hangars 2 and 3 will be used for similar purposes. After the break, the FAA says they're getting closer to a UAV rule. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing and crosswinds. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird X-Wind SE and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulation.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to be a supporter of Airborne Aero TV, our website or a podcast, send an email to jim at aero-news.net. While the FAA is close to releasing its long-awaited rule for small UAVs, this is according to UAS Integration Office Manager Jim Williams. Williams made the remarks at the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International's annual program review Earlier this month, Williams reportedly said, quote, we're taking great strides to authorize commercial operation in the U.S. and the small unmanned aircraft system rule that we've all been waiting on so long is getting really close to being done. We hope it'll be published before the end of the year, end quote. Williams said that the agency has received 117 requests for exemptions from the FAA's ban on flying small UAVs for commercial purposes. He said that despite widespread criticism of the agency, it is on track to meeting its 2015 deadline, though that does not necessarily mean full integration. It's Friday at last, and that means it's time for our weekly barnstorming commentary. This week, Jim interviews AOPA's Mark Baker about lessons learned in 2014. 
Here's this week's barnstorming. What lessons are you learning right now from the most difficult issues you've had to face this year? Well, it certainly has been a, a big year and a lot of learning for myself, but I'm, I'm really actually excited about some movement. Uh, certainly in Santa Monica I'm disappointed with, but in Santa Monica has been a disappointment for 50 years, and I think we're going to continue to uh, plow ahead with trying to protect that airport and its airspace. And, and we did have a good turnout with people that thought that you know, losing Santa Monica would be really a bad idea, um, but we'll continue to work on that one. The third class medical, I still remain optimistic. One of the things I've learned is it takes longer for the government wheels to turn than I can even imagine. But we have, you know, two really bold efforts here. We've got the FAA working on their rulemaking, which we believe will be moving through the Department of Transportation soon and on to Office and Management Budget here very soon. And it'll become public exactly what that looks like. But certainly as we get Congress back in place here in January and starting renewing that effort to move the legislation forward, we feel pretty emboldened that they're getting the largest caucus in the country of any type to uh, support us. Hindsight being 2020, are there things at this point that you've learned from these two particularly troublesome issues that will change how you work with either those issues or those agencies in the future? You know, I think uh, all of it has to be that what, what's the long-term gain that we want to protect general aviation and make sure that it's accessible and affordable and continue to find ways to work with as many constituents and partners in the aviation world as we can to try and get those agendas heard. I'm not disappointed that we've been able to pull together a pretty good coalition of aviation groups, and I'm not disappointed that Congress is listening to us better than ever. And I actually think the FAA is responding because of that effort. So I think we're getting things done. So just keep pushing it one day at a time. The latest update of Four Flight Mobile version 6.4 introduces taxi and takeoff, climb, cruise, and descent performance data fields for aircraft profiles. During flight planning, the Altitude Advisor can now be used to generate a current winds aloft forecast. The Altitude Advisor also uses aircraft performance data to make assumptions about how much time it will take an aircraft to climb to the selected cruise altitude before it needs to descend to the destination. This latest version also brings aircraft profiles and flight plans into the cloud-based SYNC feature. SYNC affords users more flexibility to move between devices during the flight planning and filing process. And For Flight Mobile 6.4 now delivers firmware update version 1.6 to the Stratus 2 and unlocks the receiver's flight data recorder, which makes Stratus 2 the only available ADS-B receiver that has this capability. For all the details, check out the For Flight website. After these messages, a business aircraft analyst says BizJet sales should get better. ADS-B will be mandatory for most aircraft by 2020 in the United States, but you can benefit from ADS-B today with the Bendix King KT-74 Mode S Transponder. The KT-74 meets the global mandates for ADS-B out when attached to a suitable WASP GPS. Finally, the extraordinary story of the world-changing XPRIZE space competition is being told and illustrated with hundreds of insider photos in Jim Campbell's colorful new book, Beyond the Blue. Journey with Jim as he flies formation with spaceships, plays in zero gravity, prepares rocket racers, and documents the amazing first decade of the personal space race. Available this summer. Get your advance order in now by checking out www.kindredspirit.com. Welcome back! After the better part of a decade in the doldrums, the remainder of the general aviation industry is finally expected to improve noticeably next year. Aviation consultant Brian Foley of Brifo says, quote, I have a deep conviction that 2015 will be the indisputable pivot point when the industry, including its laggard segments, turns meaningfully upwards, end quote. Foley likes what he sees in the way of industry metrics. Pre-owned jet inventories are at their lowest level since 2008. According to an aviation data provider, a greater percentage of the active fleet of business jets transacted in the first nine months of 2014 than in the first nine months of any year within the last decade. And business jet takeoff and landing activity is the busiest in six years. Foley said that low interest rates and reduced fuel prices are helping. And he added, quote, the industry's improved outlook will manifest itself next year as a markedly higher manufacturer backlog, increasing book-to-bill ratios, and a jump in unit deliveries in double-digit percentages, end quote. 
Elon Musk, the man behind SpaceX and Tesla Motors, has a vision of low-cost internet service for everyone on the planet, delivered by a constellation of up to 700 satellites, each weighing less than 250 pounds and costing under $1 million each. It's reported that Musk was approached by Greg Weiler, the founder of O3B Networks, and who is a leader in Google's exploration of the possibility of satellite-delivered internet services until earlier this year. Weiler recently founded a new company called Worldview. The pair has reportedly already been in discussions with entities in Florida and Colorado about the possibility of establishing manufacturing facilities in those states. The venture is still in its very early stages, according to the report, and there's no guarantee that Musk would stay with it through the launch of any actual spacecraft. It's estimated that development of the satellites would cost a billion dollars, and there are multiple regulatory hurdles that would need to be cleared. Well, that's our program for November 14th. Remember to get comprehensive real-time 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. Remember, Airborne is streamed three times a week and is always online. Join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a new episode. And remember, the next generation of Airborne will be unveiled right after New Year's. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.